Now, while it's possible to test the amp on a breadboard or a perf board, what I like to do instead, because I can do it quickly, is make a printed circuit board. And this gives me the opportunity to test the layout as well, which you really can't do even on a perf board. The way I do this is what's known as the toner transfer method. That's where you use a laser printer to print full-size copies of the copper bottom, the copper top, and the silk screen. That's what I have here. My first step, of course, is to cut those apart. And then I need to line up and tape together the two sheets that are the copper bottom and the copper top. The next step is probably the most crucial in this method, and that's to get the double-sided board really clean. I mean extremely clean. This can't be too clean. So what I like to do is sand it first with 220. That gets rid of the grunge that's on the surface of these boards. And then I clean it very thoroughly with lacquer thinner. I use lacquer thinner because I've got a full gallon can of it, but acetone will work here as well. Then after the board is clean, I'm gonna line it up over one of the prints, fold the other side down, and be careful not to move that again while the iron heats up. And then I'm gonna take the iron and very carefully just put it on top. And I'm gonna leave that for a couple of minutes without touching it to preheat the board. And then I'm gonna rub it, concentrating the force at the edge of the iron so that I'm really pushing down with a lot of force here. And once again, it's difficult to overdo this. You wanna spend a couple of minutes to give the print the best chance of sticking. From there, I take it and I put it in water, let it soak and that'll make the paper come off easier. You wanna rub all that off with your thumbs. And you can be pretty aggressive here, even using a scotch brake pad if you need to. Now there might be one or two places where the toner didn't stick, and you can fix those with a Sharpie marker. Unfortunately, that's not what I'm using here, so it just dissolved when I etched the board. But I do know that a genuine Sharpie does work. At this point, if you have a lot of things that need to be fixed, you're better off just starting again just make sure that the board is really clean this time. Now comes the fun part, the etching. I'm using muriatic acid and I'm using a very small amount of that. And I'm mixing in peroxide. This is just normal 3% stuff. And the ratio is about three to one, peroxide to acid. And then it's just a matter of moving the board around and the thing is better if you have a deeper container so it won't be slopping over the edge like mine is doing here. But I need to say that the container has to be plastic. You don't want to use metal. I haven't tried it, but I don't think you should be using glass or ceramic either. And then it really doesn't take that long. You don't have to heat anything up and the copper just dissolves like magic. After that, I rinsed out the board and I'm just using a Scotch-Brite pad to remove most of the toner. And then I'm gonna clean it up again with lacquer thinner. And once again, I gotta get the side where the silk screen is gonna go nice and clean because I'll be ironing that on next. And that's exactly the same procedure as the other parts. You just line up the board, tape it in place, and then iron it on. I normally drill the holes with high-speed steel bits, and I do that freehand, but I recently bought some solid carbide drill bits to try out, and they really need to be held rigidly, otherwise they'll break. So I made a quick and dirty drill press here, which is just a thin strip of wood with a hole drilled in one end for the Dremel to go through and clamp on there. And the other end is clamped down to a block and that keeps it the right height above the board. And then I can just use finger pressure to push it down and the springiness of the wood will make it go back up. And I found that this worked really well. I drilled all the smallest holes with it, but then I needed to make some holes bigger. So I swapped out the small bit for a bigger one and didn't get very many done before the bit broke. And the problem is that there's too much movement here. And also, I drilled a smaller hole first. If I had to start it with the big bit, I don't think it would have broke at all. So then I put a bit in that's not broken, and I carried on and did the rest freehand. So that's how I made the board. 
Um, after I did that, I put all the parts in. I didn't film any of that because it's a little bit time consuming. Um, I actually used used parts that I had to take from other boards to put in here. That's a little bit risky, but I knew they were good, so not that much of a risk. And then I took it out here and I clamped it onto a piece of aluminum angle that's kind of clamped down to my workbench here so it won't move. Hooked it up to my function generator, the scope, and my power supply to test it out and see if it actually works. And I'm happy to say <laughs> that it worked on the first try, which is kind of a miracle because that almost never happens. You know, you go from uh, raw design to board layout to making the board, putting all the parts in and testing it. And wow, it's such a relief to have that work right off the bat. So maybe I should talk a little bit about how I just like came up with the board design that I printed off on the paper. And I started with a rough idea for the circuit. I've designed ampl amplifiers before. I say design, but you know, they're basically all the same for the most part. I used micro cap to design the circuit. I was using that a couple of years ago, kind of getting used to it. So I had it in there. I was making changes to it and then. Um, and I could simulate it as well using that program, which is really handy. You can tell if it actually works in there and make fine adjustments to it. Uh, from there, I imported it into, well, I didn't import it. I had to draw it out again in KiCad. Uh, use KiCad for the uh, circuit board layout. Um, I know that KiCad can do simulation, but I'm not familiar with that part of it. Maybe sometime in the future I will. But for now, I'm using the microcap for the simulation and like the design, and then use the KiCad for uh, the board layout. I came up with a board layout that I was happy with, and that's what I used to print off. I just did the separate layers, you know, the copper bottom, the copper top, and the silk screen. I imported that into my PDF editor. I mirrored the top copper layer I mirrored and also the silk screen layer. I mirrored that as well. I put them all on one sheet, printed that off, and that's what I was cutting apart at the beginning of the video. So to test the amp, like I said, I spring clamped it to the aluminum angle. I've got it right down here. That acts as a heat sink. Uh, not a very good one, but one good enough just for brief testing. Um, like I said, I'm using my lab power supply, the one that I made a long time ago. This is good to up to 35 volts plus or minus, so 70 volts total. Um, I do, I'm gonna run this, these amplifiers. There's gonna be 10 of them, maybe 12 in this case, at 56 uh, volt rails. So that's 56 times two, which would be 112. And, um, but this amp will run on that lower voltage, no problem. And it'll tell me what it's doing. Uh, and what I'm specifically looking for is, you know, if it's working properly, of course, it needs to do that. Also, if it's stable, because that is the thing with amplifiers, especially ones you design and build yourself, it has to be stable, it can't oscillate. So I've repositioned the camera so you can see what's going on here, in particular the scope. Um, this thing here generates the sine wave or the square wave that I'm gonna be using. Right now it's set to one kilohertz. The power supply is all hooked up. Uh, nothing's gonna release the smoke because uh, I was doing this yesterday. So when I turn it on, you should be able to see a sine wave on the screen, and there it is. If we do this, you can see it a bit differently, and that looks pretty good. I'm not seeing any oscillation. Uh, nothing's heating up here crazily. Another way to test for that is to have the meter connected across the one of the emitter resistors, just a monitor the current that's being consumed and at idle which would be this turned all the way down it's down around it's around 20 25 milliamps that's what I have it set at okay so we'll turn this up again and we can see if we, if we reduce this some more we can see we can push it into clipping 
which is not happening. <laughs> Hang on. Keep going, keep going. No, I don't have enough. I don't have enough voltage here to push it into clipping. What I'll do is I'll switch that, and then I should be able to do it. And yeah, right there, it's clipping, top and bottom, right about there. Like I said, this is running at um, plus or minus 35 volts, lower than it would normally be. You can see it handles clipping quite well. It doesn't break out into oscillation. Another test to run is to switch it to a square wave and see what that looks like. You can see that's very sharp. The transistors that I'm using here are very fast, which also can cause oscillation. So it's good to see that I'm getting a nice clean square wave. That's at 1K. If I switch it to 10K, there's still, hang on, let me. Let me change things here again. You don't want to be running it too long on the higher frequency, but that looks nice and clean as well. Now I can actually take it and put it up to 20K, which is the range of human hearing, and have a look again. Hang on. And that looks like a really nice square wave right there. Nice and well, it's slightly rounded over, but that's normal, okay? There are filters on this board that will roll off the frequency a little bit, but nice and sharp and good looking. So I've got all that stuff shut down again. I wanna talk about the mechanical aspect of that, which would be the chassis, the case for the amplifier and the power supply. Um, I've actually got two transformers that will be in here. Like I said, this is going to be at least an 8-channel amplifier, maybe 10, maybe 12. It depends. I've got a lot of space inside this big box that I made well, closing in on 20 years ago. I made this originally for another 6-channel amp to replace the other one that I made previous to that um, because you just simply can't stop. But um, never finished it, and it's, as you can see, um, mostly there for a new amp. So, got big heat sinks on the sides here. All right, these are eight inches tall. The whole thing from front to back is 17 inches on the inside, I think. Yeah, 17 inches on the inside. Side to side, it is on the outside, 18 and a quarter, so quite a big box. Easily, easily get these, like, I could probably get 20 of those small amplifiers in here and have no problem. So, yeah, they will mount directly on the heat sinks, angled outwards, maybe vertically. So, you know, there'll be one after the other. Um, on both sides. Power supply will be in the middle. Also, with these amplifier boards, because um, my system is active, currently it's running on a mini DSP uh, 4x10, and that's been great. The only, the only issue I have with it is that it's a computer, and at the end of the day, a computer tends to do weird things every once in a while, and I noticed this in particular after a recent power outage. Uh, when the power came back on, everything was screwed up on the um, DSP. And it's lucky I checked before I started playing any like music through it. Otherwise, I would might have had a problem. So the analog solution is unaffected by power outages unless you get a big voltage spike and blow something out. But Nothing changes here, nothing is programmable, everything will be fixed. So I'll be making active filters for each one of the amplifier boards that go in here. And I'll have a single input or I might have more than one. I already have three on the back of this thing right now. But I may use all three. Depends upon how many amplifiers I put in here. But it'll have several more outputs. It'll have as many outputs as I have uh, channels in here. So you'll have one that goes to the woofer. It'll have a filter on the board 
to cross over the frequencies. I have one for the midwoofer, one for the midrange, one for the tweeter, and so on and so forth. So everything will, everything will be self-contained. And another big benefit of this right now, well, I have a quite a like a, a wire nightmare behind my equipment down there. There's wires going everywhere. There's like a, a rat's nest of wires, like snakes, okay? And this will clean a lot of that up because you got a single input that's going out to eight outputs. That You really can't get around the eight outputs, but right now I've got, you know, each one of those going from the mini DSP to the amplifiers that I use, so. Yeah, the power supply, like I said, will be these two transformers. These are quite powerful. Um, I got these, I salvaged these from old vintage amplifiers. This one is from an old Pioneer, I think, that was blown. I also salvaged a lot of other parts from it, but in particular, got this. This is a good, I don't know, nearly 10 pounds. This other one over here is heavier. This is actually a slightly higher voltage. But the advantage one that this one has is that it has a 22 volt winding. And I can use that 22 volt winding to power the active filters that I'll be running in here. So I'll only need these two transformers. This one will handle probably, you know, if I've got 10 amps in here, I'll have this one running the tweeter, mid-range, mid-woofer. All right, so six channels right here. And I'll use this one for the other ones, including the woofers, which draw more current. So yeah, that is the plan. And it's an ambitious one. It's a big project, and it's not going to happen overnight. 